Amazing. Well, hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We are going to talk today about how to manage a remote team. Amazing. All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm a founder and CEO of an artificial intelligence technology startup, and we simplify information. And if you imagine Google Translate, it's like you'd click a button and then it would automatically take something that's a legalese, very complicated document and put it into a grade eight or even grade five reading level. So it's super clear and easy to understand. I've been running this company entirely remotely for two years. And today we're going to walk through all the tips and tricks on how to do that. And I'm very excited as one of the top 100 winners this past November to be a part of the WXN and go through this with you today. So let us begin. All right, so if you haven't gone to this Medium post yet, um, I would recommend probably following along from here. You can see the URL. Um, you can also just search Medium Script Swap Remote Team and it will come up because it's a very long read at 22 minutes here and we're gonna scroll through it and have a discussion about different areas. So if you, if you can follow along, sometimes perhaps you could even look ahead. I also wanna make sure that we're having a conversation. And so in Zoom, you can see the Q&A area. I have it open on the side of my screen. So I'll be able to see any questions you put there. And as we go, I'd love to see them just pop up so that you can help guide the conversation as much as me. So let's begin. We're gonna be talking through the different types of meetings that you have the cadence around those meetings, the structure, the questions you ask. We're gonna dive into some of the technological tools that we use and how we just function, like what are the different technology stacks that we have. We're gonna look at more strategy, like going from the granular, what tools do we use, right up to that 30,000 foot view of objectives and key results, which is a framework within which you can anchor your entire organization. And we may not talk very much about in real life in this uh, environment because it's not possible right now, but it is definitely something that even if you choose after COVID to keep your team entirely remote, you need to make sure you have those touch points for in real life moments. And, and we do that quarterly or semi-annually. And then the last thing again, very broadly looking at mindset and how we think about um, running a remote team and the way we operate. So I'll actually probably start there. And again, as always, if you have questions, please, please, please put them in the chat. When I think about mindset, uh, it's really important that you model everything you want your team to do. So the first thing is if you're gonna ask your team as a manager, as a leader, as an executive, in my case, as the founder and CEO, you have to do it too. If you would like them to time track, you need to time track. Uh, if you'd like them to do certain reports and updates, you need to do that too. Because leadership is so much more about actions than words, we know this, but sometimes it can seem daunting or you can get the excuse for like, oh, but I'm so busy or I'm doing all these other things or, well, maybe I don't have to, or, oh, well, it's not quite my role. It is, it always is. Anything you want your team to do, you must do full stop. It is an even greater imperative in the remote environment because otherwise you'll have people feeling like, well, I'm doing all these things and you're, you know, this person isn't and they can't peripherally just see the other things you're working on. So you need to be a part of that environment. The second thing is around the mindset of remote work is that it actually is a feminist practice. I believe that. And with feminism being about the equality of men and women, remote work can enable people to have a more balanced life. Again, not in this current environment where I know many families have absolutely been struggling because there is no other option for people to go anywhere else. Uh, but when you typically have the school systems and daycares operational, but you can have flexibility in your day, it's a really amazing thing. And one of the things I really promote with our staff is, yes, if 
your child has an oral at school, go to that. Like it doesn't matter that it's at two in the afternoon, one o'clock, 11 a.m. Like flex your day accordingly and do what you need to do. And remote work can empower that in a post COVID environment. And as a manager, one of the most important things is how you are in service of your team. So the mindset as a manager is being in service of your team. I see myself as the defender of my team. It's up to me to keep the co team cohesive, happy, and functional. And that's maintaining that internal cohesion, minimizing any internal friction. Um, that could be right down to someone gets a vibe from someone else that maybe they don't like them. And I might have the context that that's not at all true, but that's how some people are feeling or you get a vibe. And then it's like, okay, well, how do we create an environment or promote an opportunity for you two to speak about that? So you can sort that out. And it's my job if I'm hearing something as a defender of my team to promote harmony, cohesion, and peace internally. And then you also want to protect them. And I think of myself as like shielding them from any external forces that could have a negative influence. Um, that means sometimes not sharing certain things that are happening or maybe someone said something out publicly about this and that. If it's not important for the team to know, they don't need to be distracted or brought down by anything that might be going on in other places. And that's your job to be that shield and you have to absorb that impact. So as a manager, it can definitely put more strain on if you feel like, okay, I have to hold this and that perspective, like I mostly have to hold it alone, but it's important. You want to protect everything you can around your team to keep them safe. But you also want to protect them from busy work and what remote work does a fantastic job of and creates incredible opportunity for is measuring based on results rather than butts and seats. I don't believe in butts and seats. I don't like butts and seats. I have had jobs where I had to go to an office for a particular time in government in particular, and I did not like it at all because maybe that day at two in the afternoon, I wasn't doing my best work. And if I could take a break, step away and come back at three or four and finish the hours or the task, I'd actually get it done rather than I sat in the chair from two to five and really didn't get anything done. And remote work can empower people to have that flexibility, take those breaks and reduce busy work. And as you look at the reduction in busy work, the structures and processes, that's what we're going to dive into next is the exact framework and formula that we use. So in a five day work week, we only have less than four hours of meetings per week. That's one afternoon total for everything for the whole team. That doesn't mean we're not necessarily not talking like we may talk uh, at different times, but it's not a meeting. And that gives you ample time to stay focused and do your work. And that creates the best work environment. Uh, at our company, I'll just quickly look, list these here. These are the values that we co-created. So a year and a half ago when we were a team of just four, we came together and said, what are the values? Because culture will happen either way. You have to make the choice to be intentional about creating that. It's going to happen whether you're intentional or not. So it's better to be intentional and take that time. And this is what we created. And part of why communicative is there is because we knew we were remote from day one. And if you feel like you're communicating too much, then you're probably just about at the right cadence. So you need to constantly be over communicating. So that's really critical. Now we're gonna slide up to specific meetings and structure. And we had an awesome question come in from Christy. Thank you so much. So I will respond to that right now. So Christy asked, you know, what are the expectations for timing and responses of team, team members via email? Even better, we don't use email internally. So that's a big no-no. So if there's an email it, and I forwarded something from the team, so if they see my name in their email inbox, that means there's something external on it and you absolutely want to be replying right away because it was an email, which means it's something related to external. If, um, Anything internal, it's all Slack. So we only communicate on Slack. And if you haven't yet, I highly recommend you read the book, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work by the Basecamp founders. They did an incredible job of articulating everything that I want my company to be. And at the whole, I was just reading it, it's full of sticky tabs. I'm actually gonna be blogging about it next. <laughs> and just like, this is amazing. Yes, that's exactly what I wanna do. 
I agree. Of course, I want to run my team this way. And what they talk about is they talk about asynchronous communication and being okay with that and knowing the difference between what you have to deal with right away and what can wait. And 90% of things can wait. And remember how we talked about being a defender of your team and busy work. Part of protecting people from busy work is you don't have to answer each other immediately. And, um, you can stay heads down, you can stay focused. And then the second thing is everything has to have a deadline. ASAP is not a deadline as soon as possible. That's not a deadline. Uh, can you do this now? Also not a deadline. I need this in 30 minutes. That's a deadline. Um, so we have a communication structure where if you're requesting things of other people, the deadline's always clear. If it is urgent, it's clear it's urgent and everything else can wait. And so that's how we manage the timing and responses because I can put forward questions to my team whenever, maybe I'm working one evening and they know that they're not to answer because I've said, Chris, I have a question about this. Can you reply tomorrow by three o'clock? So-and-so, I have a question about this. Can you get that to me by Friday at noon? So that there's always that time and you're being reasonable. And it requires you to have a great, greater thoughtfulness about your work. And it requires your entire team to have a greater, greater thoughtfulness about their work. Because it's very unthoughtful to say, ASAP, I need this now. I'm working on this now. But if you have a thoughtfulness about what you're working on, you can say, okay, I have these five things. I'm waiting on items from other people, but I don't have to do those immediately. I can focus on these other two things while I wait for those. I can give those people two days. So Christy, a little bit long-winded there, but that's how we manage that asynchronous communication, create opportunities and structure for it, and how I defend my team from distractions, from busy work or doing things that don't need to be done immediately. So let's dive right into our meeting, cadence and structure. And we have some other amazing questions coming through that we will get to. In terms of our week, this is what it looks like here. So you can see in this picture, again, it's less than four hours of meetings per week. Wednesday, we don't meet at all formally, like at all at all. And you'll see even here in the team huddles, some of these meetings are eight minutes or 10 minutes. You can have an eight minute meeting with six people, eight people. You can have a half hour meeting with on one of our sub teams, 20 people, you can have a half hour meeting and it's truly only 30 minutes and there are 20 different people and people feel heard, uh, information is shared adequately and it's very efficient and effective. And this is how, how you do that. So you need to make sure that there are pre-questions pre and pre-work for meetings. On our team huddles, this is how we keep the company cohesive as a unit. So I will acknowledge we have an advantage. We're a small startup. Uh, the core team is sub 10 people. We do have additional contractors that again, balloon us out to 20 at different times. So this is probably a technique and approach that you're going to be wanting to use in your team unit that you're managing and then have it layer up through the different managers that you may manage depending on your role. The team huddle on Tuesday is focused about individuals. What are individual team members working on? And as our team core team has fluctuated from that four, six to nine over time, that those are the only people who are on this and they have pre-work they have to do. So that's on Tuesday. And on Thursday, it's about the company overall. And it's where I, as the founder and CEO, will share what I call compass calibration. So I wanna make sure that our compasses are all pointing to the same north and that we all are driving towards the same North Star, the same goal, the same vision. So Tuesday and Thursday really complement each other and they last less than 10 minutes because of the pre-work. So on Tuesday, the pre-work, so everyone is on this call. Everyone will fill out a Slack question on Monday because we typically have this meeting on Tuesday and they'll go through blockers. Blockers are specifically supposed to be for where other team members might be blocking you because we have asynchronous communication. So if something was missed, and it certainly happens where I have a wild week of meetings and I'll come into the Slack channel Monday and see three people have blockers for me. I needed this thing for Melissa, I need this other thing. And uh, I need to have a, a conversation with Melissa too. And then usually actually I can resolve it before we even meet on Tuesday, which is fantastic, but it's written out, it's really quick. Highlights and lowlights, self-explanatory. Completed, it's always good to know, you know, when you have the working on next versus the completed, like what did, do we actually do what we set out to do? And what did the week look like? When we meet in person, we actually don't go through all these verbally because we are all able to read it. That is a very big faux pas that people will make either in presentations 
or in pre-work formats where we filled out this whole thing and then we just verbally walk through each one. You don't need to do that. We can read it. What we do need to go over is blockers if they haven't been resolved between Monday and Tuesday because that's an area where work isn't getting done because somebody's blocking someone else, which is a problem, and working on next. The reason why working on next is said verbally is that if I hear someone saying something, I can pipe up and be like, oh, I have an idea on that, or oh, you're working on that next? That's really cool and it's related to this other thing, so maybe I should shift what I'm doing. And it opens up an opportunity for conversation. Highlights are always fun, you wanna be positive, so those are said verbally, but as a group. And then they say that 80% of learning happens on the job, and so we have one to two people share in these meetings, something that they learned that is a transferable skill that they could take beyond this company. For example, my executive assistant had never worked with social media before, and now she helps <laughs> tee up a lot of tweets in Hootsuite. And then she also is an executive assistant. She doesn't do sales, but right now she operates as a SDR, which is sales jargon for someone who helps tee up sales meetings and conversations for the salesperson, which in this case is still me. And we always end with a meditation. I've done meetings where, so if you're gonna have a big conversation, I've done meetings where you start with a meditation, a practice that I started three jobs ago with like, I was the youngest person in the room. I'm trying to talk to all these older people like, we're gonna start with a meditation. And people are probably like, oh boy, this 20 something, what is she doing? But it's important because it gives you a moment to breathe. If it's one to three minutes, it's not that uncomfortable. We'll get through it because you close your eyes all together and you breathe. But what's amazing is it gives that space and time to let go of whatever you were doing before. In our team, what we do is we do it at the end because these are such quick meetings because it gives them a chance to just exhale and quietly go back to work. Because we do this on video, we don't say goodbye. We just do the meditation and everyone quietly drops off. And sometimes we miss it, very rarely, but sometimes we do. I notice a dramatic difference in how I'm able to get back to work. And they say that sometimes it can take as much as eight to 15 minutes to get back into focus. If you do a three minute meditation, you're back right away. So it's being really efficient there. And so that's the Tuesday team huddle. The team huddles are the only meetings where I require videos on. We've heard a lot about Zoom fatigue. It's very real. If we're in a development meeting and someone is sharing their screen and we're talking about the product, you don't need your video on. That's okay. And there are many days I don't want to put on makeup. I'll be in a ball cap, whatever. And sometimes, yeah, I'll put my video camera on with the ball cap. That's okay too. And that type of leadership, my team has ex explicitly said, gives them permission to not focus on what they look like when we're internal and it doesn't matter, but focus on the work. Because I've demonstrated that by just showing up in a ball cap and no makeup sometimes. Um, but Tuesdays and Thursdays, only meetings we require videos on, and it's 10 minutes. So it's, it's great. As I said, the Thursday is all about what the company does. So I'm not going to read through this, because you can read it. But basically, I break the company down into each of these categories, and I talk through key decisions that I made or work that's been done in those areas. So you can read this for a minute while I look to some more questions that we're going to answer. The name of the book that I referenced was how to, well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> the name of the book that I referenced was It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. I think it's by Jason Fried and somebody else. It's the Basecamp founders. So if you just type in crazy at work Basecamp, it'll come up because it's it doesn't have to be crazy at work. So anonymous attendee, that's been answered. You're welcome, Christy. And Angela, you asked that question too. Boom, now you know the book. One-on-one -on -one to staff. Angela, we're coming up to that next, so stay tuned. Very next, here it is, Feedback Fridays. I do have one-on-ones with my team. It is extremely important to do this, and I actually stole this from corporate. This is not a startup thing, and a lot of startups don't do it, which is astounding and I think detrimental. So I got this from some folks I know who work, one at a creative agency in New York, and another one who works at Deloitte. They are managers of teams that range from eight to 12 people. And they, as advisors and mentors to me, said, you should really make sure you're doing this. And when you couple it all together, all the, these different meetings we have, that's why it works. Because we have to have the Tuesday where everyone sees each other and talks about what they're individually doing. We have to have the Thursday where I'm mostly just helping everyone know where the company's at at a high level and keeping us all on the same page. 
and then having us answers and, and took their questions about company strategy. So everyone is engaged in that. And Fridays you have to have as well because there needs to be a private forum for people to bring forward things to you as the manager. That's very, very important. So again, there's pre-work and I'm sure you've all had a chance to read this a little bit. So I'm gonna scroll right down and only talk about this section, which is the pre-work, the prep questions. So the prep questions on Thursdays, individually people send to me individually and answer to these questions. All they do is they rank them on a scale from one to five. How did you feel your output was? Five is good, yay, amazing, like high fives. Um, results, personal growth and professional development, motivation, and then feedback is that whole start, stop, continue, what can I do? During COVID, I don't just ask that feedback question once on these Friday meetings. I will ask it three, four times. I'll say, are you sure? I'll drill down if they do give me some feedback and drill down again and again. And I also remind them, you know, with the start, stop, continue framework, that feedback can be positive as well. So some of the feedback I've received during the COVID situation is that people felt that I have been more positive, but not too positive, but I've been maintaining a lot of positivity and reinforcing that we are in a good position, that we are moving forward and we have a lot of options. And yes, we're still a startup. So, you know, we're not eons and eons here on the go and no, we haven't raised capital recently. So we're not sitting on a treasure chest. And I'm very honest about that. That's important. People need to know, but we have enough that longevity is here and that we will get through this immediate situation and move into the next phase of what we need to do to maintain our longevity and grow as a company. Um, and so because that's been clear, the feedback I've been getting on a positive level is that I have been more positive, but not too positive. And that by bringing that to the team meetings, people feel good. They're like, yeah, this is great. We got this. We're doing okay. And we're going to be okay. And we're going to get through this. So that's on the positive feedback I've been receiving lately, because this question can encompass everything. And when there's something that I need to start or stop that I'm not already doing, that's really important. And you need to try to enact it right away. And so really digging in and saying, what can I do better? What do you need from me to do your job better? How could I do my job better? Hey, when I ran that development meeting, uh, I know I was a little bit harder on you guys this week because I felt that you know, I needed to amp up a little bit of pressure here to hit some of these goals. How did you feel about that? Could I have positioned that better? How could I have said that in a way where you understood that we needed to maybe step it up a little, but that it made you feel good? So th like, those are the types of questions I would ask. And even giving that space where I acknowledge, hey, I know that I was a little, little tough on you the other day. And I could even sense that maybe it was a little un uncomfortable, but that's also partially my job as the manager. So how could I have done that job where I'm holding you accountable in a way that still makes you feel good? And as a tech company, we run development meetings. I'm not gonna go over these because everyone has a different function. Some of your companies are probably consulting, whatever. But this is just a quick overview. I'm gonna pause here and see if anybody has questions. Now, are there folks who have maybe uh, raised their hands at all? Oh no, you can't do that. You can only do Q and A. Do you have any questions about those meetings, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday? And I won't know until you type in the chat, so. Great. So I know I can speak very quickly. Um, so I'm always gonna pause like this to give people a moment. Will this be made available or sent to everyone? Anonymous attendee, you can see this right now. The URL is Medium, that's grid swap, a lot of complicated words. So if you just go to Google right now, and, you know, side split the screen where I'm on one side and your internet is on the other side. Medium, script swap, how to run a remote team. If you Google that, this will be the first hit and you can follow along with me. That's on Medium, script swap, how to run a remote team. You Google it and it'll come up. Thank you for that question. Now, one of the things that I think people struggle with with remote work is that ad hoc just walking up to someone's desk and saying uh you know hey can you can you take a look at this can you uh can you look at this here with me i have a question or hey can you come over and look at my screen how does how is this working and there's a really simple solution for that you just do it you don't have to walk over you can't go to their desk it does require more intentionality but we have a 
policy where if you need to speak to someone or collaborate on something, you can slack because it's not an immediate response and say, do you have time to jump in for a second? I have a question. Okay, can we jump in? I don't know where it came from or where it, why it's the language we use, but it's our little lingo of, can we jump in? Because we know we can't say, can you look at this for a sec? Because we're not in person. So instead we'll say, can you jump in? And then we jump in a Google Hangout link. And if you've asked to meet with them and they say yes, you send them the link. We'll jump in really quickly and share our screens and, and have a look at whatever needs to be discussed. We do this constantly. Um, and you can see it happening right here in one of our meetings where we're filling out something. And I said, hey, can we jump in for a sec and take a look? So that's how we maintain that ad hoc piece. Now work blocks, as I've said, are very important. We've got to minimize distractions. I have everyone put work blocks in their calendar every week. And you need at least four to 12 hours a week, which means at minimum, you're getting one half day work block. I mean, even the 12 hours is probably like middle of the road. Many weeks, you're gonna need more than that. Like three whole days of like undisturbed, aside from maybe a 10 minute huddle meeting. <laughs> undisturbed to do work and that is critical and something that's often missed and something that you can really read about in that book it doesn't have to be crazy at work they overemphasize this to the max and again you can reread this um, at your leisure so i'm not gonna read verbatim but i'll highlight the fact that sometimes we'll do work blocks together where we're on mute as a team but we can see each other's faces and since COVID, I've enabled team members who didn't already have monitors at their home workspace to get monitors, which Shopify also did. Amazing. That's just good leadership. And so usually you can have the faces on one monitor and your work on another. And because actually the team typically sees each other more than I do, because I'm usually off and about on planes, and the team, does, we do have an office well, we have a few offices, the Sioux, Waterloo, San Francisco, but the main one where most people can geographically get to is in Waterloo. And so folks will drive in once a week, sometimes three times, depends on the week. I, I try to set it in a non-COVID environment at once a week for the people who can't get there, but we have team members up in the Sioux, Sudbury, Vancouver, and they can't get there and that's okay they will come physically when we do team time quarterly or semi-annually and I fly everyone together. But the, so these work blocks are really important because you're quietly working together. You get the feel of being side by side, shoulder to shoulder in an office, but you're not. And then if you unmute yourself and say, oh, so-and-so, can you uh, send me blah, blah, blah document? It's like exactly what it would be in an office, even though it's a, a work block that you're doing together. So maybe not quite as quiet as on your own. It's, Something I love and highly recommend it, just quietly working with your team. It's also something that I know other organizations do. In this one group, I know they call it like study hall. It's like adult study hall. I'm like, that's kind of cool. And this right here is a, another screenshot of my calendar. I highly recommend work blocks. So this uh, work block will get usually filled in with a lot of 15 minute sales calls, but it starts as just a hold so that I know every week, I'm not scheduling things here because this is when I need to be doing sales because the best sales time according to research is Wednesday and sometimes Tuesday is second, right? So that's why I try to focus it on these days. And then you can see again, Mondays are mostly reserved for work blocks. And this is a specific task that I'm doing during this work block and then we did add dev meetings on Monday. I prefer to not have any meetings Monday, but it is internal and the dev team needs it. Um, so that's a specific business function. And you can decide if your team needs that for whatever type of business you do, consulting or whatever. And you can look at this at your own leisure. I already felt this was too long at 22 minutes, so I didn't post like another two pages I have in Microsoft Word on guidelines. But some of those guidelines I'll go through verbally are the fact that I meet with my assistant every morning, nine o'clock. We have uh, sometimes five, sometimes three, sometimes 45 minute call <laughs> and establish what each of us are doing for the day because I rely on her so heavily and because we aren't together. Uh, often we are a country in a time zone apart. So that's how she and I, when we work really closely together, stay connected every day. We start the day checking in. And other guidelines are reserving most meetings till the afternoon. You'd see that even in our 
structure for other team meetings during the afternoon because everyone's best work time is the morning and circadian rhythms dictate that your body temperature drops and you get more drowsy plus there's a whole post lunch sleepies so basically like in the afternoon it's not your best thinking time but you can all probably chit chat and talk so it's a great time to have those types of meetings that's why we put them in the afternoon all right we have another question that i'm going to ask answer and i'm going to apologize for any mispronunciations i always feel guilty with a last name like Karjanakis that i don't do a better job of pronouncing other people's names but here we go so kishore has asked how do you manage when you have a lot of unplanned and ad hoc work if you can clarify as a follow-up, Kishore, I'd appreciate it, but I'll kind of start by saying there are literally gaps. I literally have a block in my calendar called emergent time. This is not allowed to be scheduled until Monday. So this, even if this gets filled up with meetings, this gets filled up with meetings, this does not. This is my, something comes up every week, we just know that it does, and this will not be, um, filled in until that the day before like it just can't maybe even Friday you could put some stuff in here but otherwise you just you just don't there are other availability options Friday I find I'm not very productive when I think of the flow of the week that's why I like Monday's to be my work block week because I'll crank out everything under the sun I know someone Jen Quildry from the Upside Foundation if I can name her also a top 100 winner um, she does all her work on Friday so what I do on Monday she does on Friday but Friday I love to just like stack with calls because I just, I like chit chatting and it's like you're getting things done, but you're not having to do the thinking work that your brain is just toasted for. Uh, so hopefully I answered that question. Kishore is like, if you have a lot of ad hoc work, you have to be able to keep gaps for it. And you have to also be able to ruthlessly prioritize. And when you're thoughtful about your work, you're able to then say, hey, these, this ad hoc thing came up because I'm thoughtful about my work, I know that it's more important than these other things I was planning to do, and I will move them. And I think I talk about that later on in this blog post somewhere where I've said that, because see how this was over a work block, a thing that I was supposed to be doing during that time. And these time, well, meetings are harder, but say like in a work block, I put a specific thing I needed to do, like review this document, write this blog post, whatever. I will bump things. <laughs> if something ad hoc comes up, that thing I was planning to do can get bumped for like three weeks, maybe longer, which is so bad, but it just, then it's not a priority and oh well, um, plans change. So hopefully that answers your question, Kishore. Make sure every week you have emergent time somewhere in your calendar that is not allowed to be booked until the day before or two days before. All right. Oh, thank you, Virginia, for sharing the article so that people can get it. Great, so the tools we use, we're gonna go micro and then we're gonna go macro. So if you remember when I talked about the things we're gonna go through today, we're getting into the latter half at exactly the halfway point, 44 uh, minutes. Oh, that might be wrong because I came in early, but <laughs> at almost the halfway point, we're getting into the last half of the presentation and please keep sending through your questions because I wanna make sure that this is valuable and useful for you. So we said we were gonna talk about meetings and mindset, which we did. And we said we were going to talk about the tools that we use specifically, as well as going more strategy level with OKRs. So let's look at the tools that we use. So a tool agnostic version is right here. What I said, you, you don't email internally, like you can't. Email is already such an overflow mountain uh, for externally facing folks in particular, you don't need internal meetings. They are getting all cluttered. So if you separate out where internal and where external goes, it's much, much easier to prioritize. And so this is the tool agnostic version. This is, these are the specific tools that we use. And I do have a note here that I actually think Basecamp could probably replace like three of these, like these three could possibly, and sync could be replaced by one tool, but who knows? You have to keep the openness to change if you want to. Right now this works for us, but it's certainly something I brought up to the team of like, maybe this summer we could do a test to see if we want to transition to something else. So these are the specific tools we use. You can read about them here. 
And again, everything has to have a deadline. Just like when you send to your team members, can you do X, Y, Z? Can you help me with, I need help with, here's this document, can you review it? Whatever the ask is, there's a deadline every time. Just like that, you cannot have anything in Trello without a deadline. If you've created a card, it has to have a deadline on it. Automatically, if cards do not have a deadline on them, when we as a team are in the, the, the various Trello boards that we have, or my assistant goes in them, it automatically gets put in this list that we call the parking lot because it didn't have a deadline on it. And if that's a mistake someone made, it will get rectified the next time we look at that board or if they're trying to find it. Um, but that's the rule. You must have a deadline. The consequence, it gets put in the parking lot because obviously if it didn't have a deadline, it must not have been important. Uh, or it wasn't clear that there was a time that it needed to get done so it can go in the parking lot. Uh, a lot of people use Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, all these other things. I'm very uncomfortable with Google Drive's terms of use. Yes, I've read them, so I don't use it. Um, even when it's the paid for version, I'm just, there's some clauses in there that make it sound like they can just take your stuff for no reason, like just if they want to. And I'm like, well, it's not yours, it's mine. So um, Sync is a Canadian version that's allegedly more encrypted. Is this, not helpful, sir. Sure, sometimes like Box, Dropbox, all those other things can plug right into Slack and maybe that's great. Ours can't at all. <laughs> and that's by design because we don't want it to because I want to have more secure cloud storage. It also helps us when we're filling out InfoSec requests for some of the banks and insurance companies we work with. So we have another question here from Kathy. What do you do when the team doesn't meet a deadline or have someone who constantly ignores the deadlines? So I'll repeat the question from Kathy. What do you do when the team doesn't meet the deadline or you have someone who constantly ignores the deadlines? Hmm. Fascinating. This is less of a remote work problem and more of just like a general management people problem by the sounds of it. And it is definitely, I say problem in no uncertain terms because it is a problem. Timelines and deadlines are critical because that's how people know how to work with one another. And we're all puzzle pieces trying to build one beautiful vision and we rely on each other. And if you say you're gonna do this by a certain time, I'm being thoughtful about my work that I'm gonna pick up that up as soon as I get it from you and I'm waiting, like working on other things while I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden, if it doesn't come through, I'm, I'm being blocked, a blocker, which we talk about in our other meetings. And the values that we hold, I mentioned communication, but one of our other values is considerate we say that it is considerate to meet deadlines. So we call that one of our core values as a company. And before this company, I'm going to be candid in that I probably wasn't the best person at deadlines as an employee at different times in my life. I think of one thing in particular where I had one task that I had to do. I wasn't really excited about it. It's a lot of paperwork, my least favorite thing. Um, I don't know, well, lawyers like paperwork, but aside from that, I don't know other people who like paperwork. So it was like this paperwork thing. In the end, it ended up being successful and it got this other organization money and it's great and I did a good job, cool. But I was asked for it over the phone by a certain time and I didn't, I was like, oh, it's like, do they really need it by then? Like to me, it was just, what it didn't feel that it was like, is that the deadline or did they just like say that? And that's like young naivete. So I mean, Speaking of someone who's been on both sides of it, how I would handle that is being empathetic with myself at that time is being really clear on, okay, this is when the deadline is. Does that deadline work for you? Which is just, again, being considerate. That's when I need it, but does that even work for you? So Kathy, I don't think there's anything wrong with starting by saying, does, does that timeline work for you? Um, and then saying, okay, now what are the things you're gonna do to break that up to meet that goal? And I think having a manager, it's something that I do as a manager now, but in this one particular memory that I shared, I think having had a manager who was like, okay, let's break it up. It, you know, it seems like it's something you don't like. You miss the deadline once. Uh, it seems like something you aren't enjoying. Is, is that true? Yes, I don't like it. Great. Um, it needs to get done and you need to do it. Tough. Everyone has that in their job. Um, cool. Okay. So how do we make it into something where you're just doing focused subcomponents and you're doing them by a certain time so that 
you're going to hit the deadline because I made you do something on this day and then on this day and this day in service of that deadline. Uh, so then Kathy, at least maybe if they miss the deadline yet again, maybe you got 60, 70 percent of it from those mini deadlines leading up to it. And then there also needs to be stern com conversations. We're a startup, but I've fired people and you have to. There have to be stern conversations of expectations are here. Your performance is here. There is a gap. What can we do to close that gap? And then if that doesn't work, then they need to go. And perhaps as a startup, we're a little bit speedier on that flow, but it is a matter of finding out if there's an emotional barrier, they don't like it. A uh, workflow barrier, does that deadline even work for you? Are there other things in your workflow? Maybe I can help you reprioritize. Then breaking it up into smaller chunks and getting deliverables, subcomponents delivered in the interim, and then being realistic about overall expectations, performance, that gap, which is phase one of the you're going to get fired conversation. You do a phase two of it and then letting them go. So that's the flow I would go through, Kathy. And good luck. That's not easy. It's hard. All right, anonymous. How do you ensure your employees are working at capacity, especially on tasks where you don't have the depth of knowledge so cannot reasonably estimate how long the work will take? Oh, Oh, anonymous person. Hi, I am a self-taught coder, barely can code, and I manage an entire artificial intelligence technology company. Boy, oh boy, do I know this question. So um, I'll scroll down here for folks who maybe don't have any interest in these answers. I want to read some of what's on the screen here. So I'll scroll to here. Folks can read that, and then I will answer this question. It is hard. So I have no idea how long it takes to do certain development tasks because I can't, I can code, I coded our first prototype like years ago, but it was not good. And, you know, I don't have a clue. Like if I'm being honest, I don't know. I, I know the knowledge at the high level and general oversight and the, no, I don't know how long it's going to take to code that one thing or fix that one thing, but eventually you get a little bit Mm, like you get some level of familiarity. So consulting, this might be harder. So if you work in consulting and you're jumping from company to company, it might be harder for you to do that estimation. But if you're managing a team doing the same thing, like I do for development, I kind of know that changing a button should not take more than 15 minutes, whether it's the look, feel, color, or what the button does. Like 15, 45 minutes, that's it. If you need to change something about a button. And so you get to a point where you just kind of know that. And then you say, and I've definitely said this before, hey, that button that was on, you know, your task to complete, we put it on your task on Monday. It has to be completed by Thursday. We're talking on Wednesday. Have you done that button yet? No, I didn't do the button. Okay, the button's a quick win for you. And to make sure you meet that deadline, I suggest after this ad hoc chat we're having that you finish that for like 15 to 45 minutes before diving back into the big thing you're working on because then you'll make sure you meet the deadline for Thursday and you'll feel good getting a quick win, right? But then there are other tasks such as in the month of March, we redesigned a whole portion of our backend system because we had this huge group of these like subcontractors that I talked about, like the 20 people who came on as contractors doing some data work for us. Now the deadline was immovable and clear. April 1, folks are getting trained. April 6, they're starting to work on this. So it had to get done, full stop. And it was a big undertaking because we had to make some of the back end of the machine talk to this other area. And basically you have people who have no coding training doing data science, which is amazing. And if you as a company can facilitate people who don't know how to code doing data science work, then you've built a good interface. So we had to do that. And we had about a month to do it. Uh, that's really tough, but it's the constant communication, breaking it up into smaller pieces because you can easily tell how long a button should take. That whole project's pretty hard. Um, so I communicate with my team a lot. I will also use past reference points. So I'll be like, last time when we made this other part of the interface, it took X amount of time. You're telling me it's now going to take Y um how can we get it closer to x or what are the differences between these two projects that to me feel really similar so i think you should finish it in x time like in the past but you're telling me it's going to take y time why is that 
and not being afraid as a manager to say, explain it to me and being humble and honest and something I do all the time of just, so you know I have no idea if that number is accurate or not, so explain it to me. Why is it gonna take that long? Explain to me how this works. Um, it's, it's awesome when you're transparent like that because you again give your team permission to do the same thing to you. And then you actually get richer questions and greater engagement. In terms of working at capacity, the number one thing you have to remember is capacity fluctuates week to week. I'm not working at 100% every week. And in fact, this week is one of those weeks where I'm not. I took Monday off for my birthday and I didn't really have the best productivity day yesterday and that's okay. And again, leading by example, my team knows that that's okay if they have weeks like that. Capacity will fluctuate and you have to acknowledge that number one. And then at an aggregate level, if week to week it's shifting in a month, what is getting accomplished and are we meeting our goals? So that's how I would think about capacity and being human, being fair and demonstrating by example, if you're not doing a great, great work, don't work. Just like what I did yesterday, wasn't doing good work. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to call it. I'm going to step away for the rest of the afternoon because I'm not doing good work. And I was working at capacity. I hit it and then I stepped away. Um, and then always asking more questions and being honest about your knowledge level and, and asking why, explain it to me. Okay, break it down for me. What are you gonna work on and how are you gonna get there? So, anywho, hope that answers your question, anonymous person. Virginia has also posted a link to the It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work book. Healthy conflict and friction is gonna come up in a minute. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Kathleen, for the humanity of my approach. We're humans first, workers second. That's really important. And you're welcome for answering that. So one quick thing on Slack channels, and then we're going to zoom right down. You've had a chance to read these. Uh, my favorite one, far and above my favorite, is this one. This is our Humans of Script Swap. I just put SKR for short, channel. And this is where, as I said, like we're seeing people's weddings. Uh, you know, we use the yellow heart because yellow is the color of friendship and that it's not like aggressive at work, but we do love it in a yellow friendship way. Um, you know, seeing Chinese New Year, projects where people are painting, like amazing, and, you know, going out in the snow in our Canadian winters. So Humans of SKR is where we digitized the water cooler. So it's a channel where we're having all those conversations you'd have in passing in the halls or at the water cooler, but in a specific dedicated place where we get to celebrate one another and get in touch with each other's lives. People can share as much or as little as they want. They're not put on the spot in a meeting. It's an asynchronous communication Slack channel. You answer when you can and you know you chat about it <laughs> and engage if you want or not if you don't. So I highly recommend in this digital world to maintain that connection, make a humans of your company name Slack channel and that's where all of your humanity should be and you can engage with one another. I love it, it's my favorite. Also, call each other. Uh, I probably do this the most, but we know that if someone is calling you, and uh, for some staff we do partial payments of their personal cell phone plans because we don't provide phones. So instead we do like partial payments of cell phones for some staff if they're ones we call a lot. I don't do it for developers because I don't call them that much uh, comparatively. And so then if, if my phone rings and I see it's one of my staff, first of all, they're the only people in my favorites, sorry, mom, <laughs> on my phone. So even if my phone's on silent, my staff can get through as well as some key investors. And we know that the phone call is reserved for like, oh, we really need each other. Uh, so if you think of the levels of urgency, like the, a random Slack message with a deadline, whatever. A, hey, can we jump in for a second? That means like, I wanna work on this now. And hey, sometimes people say no, and that's okay. But if we can jump in, then we'll jump in. A phone call is like, I need you now. I am interrupting you. Yes, it is interrupting your work block. And no, it's not a distraction because it needs to get done. So we love the telephone. Write things down. Oh my goodness. It is so important to write things down. Now, as you can tell, I'm a talker. I love talking. I talk through my thinking, talk through my feelings. Um, 
class was a joke, but anyway. Um, I process best by verbally communicating and I have my best ideas when I'm just in a verbal flow. I won't even remotely in a thoughtful typed up Slack message get the same thing that I'll get out of speaking. So that works for me, but it doesn't work for my team. My team prefers to have things written down because then they're not in written in stone, but kind of like it feels more, ah, this is a thing that's important. And remember when I talked about in my younger years where someone was like, yeah, can you do this by this time? And it was a phone call and I was like, is that really a deadline? Like we just kind of set it on a call, right? So I empathize with that where it's like, no, no, I've put it in writing. This is when it is. Now in a remote work environment, putting things in writing and being clear is absolutely critical. So as we transition from specific granular things, we're gonna, we're in the process of transitioning up to our strategy level OKRs is the last thing we'll look at before that. Standard operating procedures, write things down and repeat yourself. So I will do on Slack, which is our internal communication platform. I've got to record it, recordify, I believe, or re record, yeah, recordify integration where I hit forward slash record and then I just start talking. And then I'll play it back for myself and type in another message right after that, the key things that I wanted them to get out of that voice memo. So I'm satisfied because I got to send a voice memo that works best for me. My team is satisfied because then I, I could even re-listen to it and say, okay, these are the key things I need done. Um, and repeat, 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 repeat what you do. That's why we have every Thursday explaining where the company's going and what we're doing. Sometimes it changes week over week. We're a startup. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but you need to say it again and again and again and again. Very important. It's important in general. It's even more important in a remote work environment. And then I also love this little tool by another Canadian startup, OB, where you can, you know, have automatic Q&A to some key questions that people need to know. Uh, all right, this is what I was just talking about. It is... Fantastic. Like just, if you're a talker, good, be a talker, but then put it in writing because your team needs it, meet their needs. All right, I'll stop actually here for a second and just take a minute to see if there are any other questions. Oh, hey, Kathleen, you're no longer anonymous. And thank you, Amitha. All right, let us dive in. So OKRs are not necessarily a remote work thing, but they are super important for, and Kathy just asked, do you use project plans and roadmaps? We do, it's called OKRs. Uh, this is how we do it. And then you break it down further into specific project plans and roadmaps. So we're gonna dive into that right now. One of our advisory board members, Emily Key, who is amazing, taught us about this and you need to read the book. So another book you need to read uh, right here. Woo! Copies of Radical Focus by this Christina W. Uh, Radical Focus. It's a really quick and easy way to understand what objectives and key results are. And then the way we do objectives and key results is we actually build them bottom up so I always have an idea of what I think I want the company to be doing, but because every week on Thursday, I tell the team what's happening in every single sub area, it is very easy for them to engage as well. And, uh oh, we're about to have a battery problem. Time out, pause. Got my plug ready, but didn't plug it in. So crisis averted. <laughs> so even though I think I know, okay, wait, wait, back up. All right, we're talking about objectives and key results. And that is your company strategy, your overall goals and how things happen. So objectives and key results, you can read the book Radical Focus by Christina. I like to build them bottom up from a grassroots perspective rather than me dictating down because as a solo founder and CEO, it can feel like 
being a dictator. So, and I don't want to feel that way when you have to draw the line. I'm fully okay with taking the responsibility and accountability of, I have to make the choice. I'm making the choice and I alone am responsible for the consequences of that choice. But when we're designing where the company should go, there are a lot of different perspectives to someone's question previously. What about if you don't have the knowledge? And a lot of the times you don't because different people in your team have different specific knowledge and, and function, functional information for a certain group. So using all that knowledge and taking it together, we build our OKRs from the ground up because every single Thursday I'm talking about management, communications, marketing, sales, development, product, users, customers, every element of the organization, investors, fundraising. The team knows what's going on in those areas because it's shared at the level that it needs to be shared at. And so we come to our OKRs meetings a few weeks before, and the team will actually present what they think the one, one company objective for that quarter, actually since 2020, we've been doing them on two months, two months at a time, which may not make sense, but it makes sense for us. So just two months at a time is when we plan our OKRs since 2020, and especially in light of COVID, that's worked really, really well. It's just long enough to make sense and just short enough that it's not a full quarter because we can't really be thinking in full quarter or even full months right now. So two months really works for our overarching goals. One company objective and then key results for the functional units, whether it's sales, product, or users that need additional information underneath them. Now, we've given you a cheat sheet. Read the book, get your team to read it. Pretty much if you just look at these pages, you're good. Um, and when everyone comes and brings the company goals, it's bubbling up. And then I get to come in and most of the time it's just like, yes, we were all on the same page with slightly different variations of the same thing. Behold, now we will move forward and everyone feels like they're on the same page. This is great. Um, but sometimes I have to say, you know what, you're right. That's a really interesting project and something we should do, but it is not something we're going to do right now for X, Y, Z reason. And here's the additional context as to why we're not going to set that as our one company objective now, but maybe we will in six months. So that's, you're more of a fine tuning barometer checker rather than a, this is what we're doing. That's not fun. But you can't get people engaged with that. And you need the knowledge of different skill sets. So you can read through this. I'm actually probably not going to dive into it as much as I thought I would. Key results should be difficult, but not impossible. Another amazing thing about them is that they should be measurable. So same thing with everything has a deadline. More sales is not a key result. Saying we're gonna add a quarter million, two million or 20 million in the next two months, that is a key result. Um, we're gonna have the accuracy of our technology increase from 10% to 20% in the next four months. For this key result, uh, sorry, for this key result for the two months that we're measuring right now, it's gonna be a 7% increase. And here's the way we're gonna measure it. And here's how we know that the machine is more accurate. Like that, that's what it should look like. It's very exciting. And so we time track every day, which rolls up into our OKRs. And it helps you with how do you know if your team's working at capacity or how do you know um, if the right things are being worked on or how many hours it takes to do certain things. And this also speaks to as a manager, you need to do what you ask your team to do. We time track because we have government funding that we need those time tracking reports. We time track because then we actually know what we did I love it because sales has become an increasing part of our company as we move from being pre-market into a market, like in-market technology. And that transition happened through this fall. And I noticed the results changed when I went from spending only 30% of my time every week on sales to over 50%. And there were times when I was spending less than 30% of my time on sales. And looking at what deals got closed, what happened, like what were the results, uh, which you track, everybody tracks the results. That's so much easier. But when you also have time tracking on a daily basis and every day we have to do a screenshot of, you know, did we do our time tracking? 
it's easier to do a screenshot because then it's like we put it in the right system where it's supposed to be in Harvest and we share the screenshot in the specific channel on Slack. So it's not too much extra work to just send a screenshot somewhere to just validate that you did it. And it's just like that team accountability. If you don't do it every day and everybody else does, like you kind of, oh, they did it, but I didn't. Oh, I better do it, right? <laughs> so that team accountability, like, it helps. So the time tracking, I know it, when it was less than 30% of my week on sales, not a lot was happening there. When I'm in that 30 to 50% sweet spot, I'm still able to perform my entire function. And oh my goodness, that 30 to 50%, what we get done in sales is exactly what we need. And I still have all that other time to perform the other functions of my role, which are very demanding, HR, financials, investor relations, current customer relations, managing the team, doing all those meetings and check-ins, which thankfully there's not too many, running product, right? But if sales is really important, you need to spend that time and time tracking will give you that insight. And there are a lot of different things you can use. We use Harvest, but I also use, it's called Zai, Z-E-I. It's a physical thing that you flip because I'm super tactile. And so I'll just flip it on my desk and the different sides say what you're working on. I love it. So lots of other options. This is our in real life thing, which I'm not going to talk about much more. I think that's it. So I can dive deeper into any of these areas. I can discuss more about OKRs and key results. I can talk more about our products. I can answer more questions. We've been living like this for two years. There's a slight difference in the COVID world, but not much. So questions. We've had two people asking about some sort of recording. I know that WXN is recording it. I'm asking for a copy because I'm probably going to chop it up into little videos and post them on my LinkedIn. Here's why we do OKRs this way. Here's what we do in these team huddle meetings. Here's the three most important meetings you need every week. So it's my understanding there will be a recording. There will, it will be available and I'm definitely going to. And Virginia said it will be shared with all registrants tomorrow. And I'm gonna use the copy that I get to post about it in smaller bite-sized snack videos. I've got some people saying yay, that they're excited to get copies, great. All right, ooh, let's go back to Deborah's question. So Deborah has a great question about healthy friction and conflict. It can serve a great purpose if not destructive. So Deborah wants to know what we do with healthy friction, conflict, and how it can serve a great purpose that it's not destructive. 150,000% agree. As you have probably gathered, I'm pretty direct and clear. I think it's just easier, less mental gymnastics for folks, but you can still do it in a way that's really kind and respectful. And so with the friction and conflict, I will say I don't agree. Um, or help me understand why you think that. Like I'll full on, not I wouldn't say get combative, but I could see how people could like perceive it that way. Um, but definitely I will, I couldn't think of a better word, like get, get combative. We're gonna have discussions. We're gonna have serious discussions. And I'm gonna say, I actually don't think that's the way we should do this. Here's what I think, what do you think? And I think and like friction and, and conflict are so important because that's how you learn, that's how you grow, but then you have to create space for it and you can still have those difficult conversations and maintain psychological safety. So that's the other thing you have to do is make sure people feel okay. But as the manager, the burden always falls on you. It is not up to your team to try and tell you that they don't like something. That's why every single week I'm asking, how can I do better? How can I do better? Is there a way, what, what can I do to help you do your job better? What can I do to help you feel more productive? But then in the moment, if you're trying to say, this is the direction we're taking and people don't agree, you as the manager have to get a vibe. That's why as, when we can, videos are on, sometimes they're not, that's okay too. But you can hear it if people are quiet. Um, 
And you can also do the, hey, uh, let's, uh, let's do this ABC thing. Do you agree? Should we move forward? And then people will come off mute and you might hear them say, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. Or like if you're on video chat, you can tell. So you as the manager have the responsibility to say, I get a sense that people aren't super excited about this plan. Or I get a sense that you may not agree. Can you tell me more? And just by saying that, you can open up in a really safe and healthy way, fantastic divergent thoughts about how to do certain things. And usually you end up in a better place. I think just two weeks ago on a Thursday, we ended up in this amazing brainstorming place. And one person you know, says, you know, we need to do this project because it's going to really improve the accuracy of the machine. It's so important. I come in, I'm like, yes, it is, but it's also a very expensive project to run. And it's time consuming. And we have these other priorities that I think are going to move the needle more. Then somebody else pipes in and is like, no, Melissa, you're wrong. Uh, I think we need to do this other thing. And then somebody else goes, hold up, everyone. Uh, any of those things rely on this data set when we actually need this data set plus something else. So if we only train on this without the other piece, it's a moot point. It won't actually help the machine. And we all just went, oh, so we're all like having this conversation about different schools of thought. And well, I think we should do this. Well, no, that doesn't make sense right now. Oh, well, maybe we should do that, but in this way. And then someone just pipes up, y'all are all wrong. And it's great. So Deborah, I don't know if that helps. Uh, thankfully in that little, I guess, slightly long answer. We got some more questions. So thank you, Deborah. Uh, keep people safe, lead by example, ask them if they really agree. Even if they look like they're agreeing, be like, do you think that's a good plan? How would you do this differently? That's your job as the manager to do. All right. Okay, how might this be adapted for a large corporate entity which does not have tools, only has email and Zoom? So if you only have email, use the square brackets at the front of your email and make like decide for your team. So I'm going to assume anonymous person. If you're a large corporate entity and you have a management type position, you're probably looking at at least 20 people under you. So if we're going to assume that you have a team of 20 in this big place and you only have email and Zoom, first of all, God bless you. It will be okay. Um, second of all, you can use square brackets in your emails to do this. You can use square brackets to do your team huddle and you do your uh, team huddle week of uh, May 4th, square brackets, and you post your blockers, highlights, lowlights, whatever, and then everybody else replies to that email. Then the next week you do the same thing, like the square brackets, team huddle, and then outside the brackets would be week of, right? So then you're kind of taking what you would normally do on Slack or split into channels, you're putting it into email. You can use those square brackets to do, okay, we have a team of 20, we're responsible for these three projects. So you have project one, project two, project three in square brackets, and then whatever the subject line is. So then people can sort and sift much easier. And you can do time tracking like at the end of people's days. Maybe it sucks, but maybe it's like in um, Excel and you just go like end of day time tracking and it could just be like time tracking and then whatever the subject line is or the square brackets. As long as there's a square brackets that kind of delineate what this email is about or what category it fits in, you can turn it into something where then they can either have filters so that for time tracking, it's never going to be marked as unread because you're never going to read it. It's just like an accountability thing. You as the manager are, but nobody else is. Um, or with the square brackets, they know, oh, I don't have to pay attention to that. It's got square brackets. I'll you know, focus on my other emails from customers, right? So that's how I would institute it. Uh, if you're trying to actually do these specific things, if you only have email, because I think the only thing you're missing there is Trello for project planning, which, you know, Word docs, um, using square brackets and emails to split different email threads for some of the time tracking or team huddle communication type things. And Zoom, you have the Zoom meetings like you normally would. So hopefully that helps. All right, this is amazing. Look at all these questions. I'm so excited. All right, we have, I'm gonna just read them quickly. All right, I'm gonna answer Kathy's question first, then Amitha. So Kathy asked, do you run multiple streams of work in your organization where teams multitask? How do you handle prioritization? We usually have one member of the team that seems to do most of the work 
So everyone wants that person's help. So that can lead to confusion as to what they should be focused on. Everyone thinks their tasks are the most important. So Kathy is asking a great question about prioritization. And remember how I was saying everyone is kind of coming to each other and saying, this is the deadline. You know, the follow-up question is always, does this work for you? Uh, but I think the second way is if you have multiple streams of work with different teams that are multitasking and perhaps a cross-functional person, which it sounds like this is what Kathy is experiencing, and a lot of people are relying on that person or even within each sub team, there's someone that tends to stand out and everybody else is like asking them for things. You as a manager need to work with that person and a great place to start opening this conversation is on that Friday check-in you have. And oh, and Friday check-ins are mandatory video as well. So Friday check-in, you need to be checking in with them and say, hey, I noticed that as your manager, there was some confusion around um, these deadlines because this project didn't get done and people said that that's because they didn't get what they got from you, but then these other two projects got done, but they weren't as important as this one. Um, so what's kind of happening here? Um, and if that language is too outcome driven, you can say, hey, like, how are you feeling? It seems like you have a lot on your plate. Um, so any realm within that, but you as the manager need to talk to them individually but then as a team, you need to help the team understand and be able to, as a team, prioritize so that certain projects, it might be really important and the only thing this team is working on, yay, but they have to humble themselves enough and you lead by example and you make it a team effort. We're all driving towards this one goal. Everyone has a part to play. This is an orchestra. You gotta have strings, bassoon, brass, and woodwinds. It's a thing, everybody matters, um, but you have to say sometimes the strings are the most important, right? Like, so that you help them understand which projects for the whole organization or for your whole unit within a large corporate are the most important. So at a team level, certain teams can say, all right, we know that that takes priority. So we're going to have to wait a week, which means we might have to work on something else while we're waiting for that person who has to do this other thing. It's a lot of work. Managing is hard. I love it. Like, I love it. But I, it's a lot of work. I could see how a lot of people don't enjoy it. It has, it's very intentional. I'm constantly reading articles, books, talking to other folks. It, managing is hard work on top of actual work work. So you need to be spending that time to get really good at managing. Just, just being able to manage. You have to look at human psychology. You have to look at you know, Harvard Business Review articles. You have to ask your team what they want. Very great place to start. So um, Kathy, I hope that helps. It's just communicate, 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 lay it out. You also prioritize. Like sometimes my assistant, because we talk every morning, her prioritization changes daily. She knows it, she's gotten used to it. And sometimes she'll say, oh, so-and-so asked me to do this thing, even though I pred she predominantly works for me. Like they need help with this because she does sometimes support the team. You know, can I do, yes, of course. Like. Or no, actually, you cannot do that thing for them. A couple of weeks ago, a team member needed her to do something. And I was like, yes, you are the right person to help get that done. I need you to work on my stuff Wednesday, Thursday. You can switch and do that entire task for her on Friday, right? So you lead by example and then get your teams to do the same thing. Where, no, you're not the most important today. <laughs> um, learn to spread the load. Um, but then the other uh, element of that is in the every day she'll actually send me, and we just do this because we work together the most. It might be valuable for other team members, but every single day she sends me a list of like what she's working on that day and what I need to work on that day, which is great because it helps remind me of things that I said, hey, can you remind me to do this? And then I compare to my list and go, oh, how do I adjust it in light of what she thinks I need to do? And it's really great because every morning before we get in that 9 a.m. slack, before we get in that 9 a.m. call, we see it over Slack Bong says, this is what I'm working on. Melissa, this is what you're supposed to be working on. And then we can, all I do is I reprioritize. I'll just usually reply to it and put the numbers in a different order. And if she wants to talk to me about it, we'll talk about it. Um, so there, there's ways you can do it at that granular level too. All right, thank you for all the people who are saying thank you and saying nice things and the birthday wishes, I appreciate it. All right, Amitha has a question. What are the top three things that you have done to build trust with your remote team? It's the top three things to build trust with my remote team. Number one, always do what you want your team to do. 
If I want them to time track, I need to time track. If I want them to report on certain outcomes and activities, I need to do the same thing publicly for them to see and hold me accountable as well. So always do what you want your team to do. Number one, that builds trust. That leads by example. Number two, being human, asking the human questions. Uh, you, I definitely have days where I'm like, I'm not productive. I'm just not working anymore. I'm out. Bye. Um, that gives my team space, space and time to do the same thing. They can say, you know what? We're all human. Today's not a good day for me. Or my kids really need me today. I, can I just not work? And then the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is, shoot, actually you're responsible for this one really important thing. Can you put in two hours and then take the rest of the day? Or can you train someone else to do that one thing that's important? Like that's, that's how it works. Being human, acknowledging things and being realistic. And the third thing to build trust, which is difficult in the post COVID world, but you have to have some level of in real life. You just have to full stop. We, I have to spend the money to fly my team together every quarter or uh, twice a year. I have to, that is so critically important. And I have some team members with families where, you know, it's looking like down the line, I'll be flying their family or, you know, paying to have them, you know, rent a vehicle if that's possible or paying to have one or two, maybe two hotel rooms for that one person, because for that one week I need them there. And maybe there's some familial circumstances where they got to bring everybody. What can you as an employer do to empower them to be present and be able to come because you have to have in real life. And if they have other factors that you need to help take care of, then you need to help take care of it. Too often the world is structured in a, that's your problem, uh, rather than a, how can I help you be your best self at work? And what resources do I have? And yes, yeah, sometimes you know what, that's not my place to step in and you need to figure it out. But within my bounds, what can I do to help support you and make that happen so that we can have that in real life time so that we can come together and you just, you just have to. So to recap the three things, do what you want them to do, be human and have in real life time. We're just about at the end here, and I don't know if anyone from the WXN team has follow-up questions, perhaps for the last 10, 12 minutes. Hi, Melissa. No, we don't. We don't. Great any more questions um i'm just checking here to see if anyone there's none in the q a so then i guess none in the q a yep wow oh wait one last one here all right this will be the last one we answer another one from kathy great questions Perfect. Um, Thank you. and this will be the last question we answer since it's slowing down 32 questions in how do you change your management style for an introvert versus an extrovert? Ooh, so I'm guessing that this is on an individual level. So one introvert, one extrovert, me as the manager, those individual people. If I am a manager of an extrovert, they need a lot of space to share their own ideas. Uh, they also need to be empowered to be in communication with other team members, be able to speak to folks, um, then you have, you know, on the introvert side, I recommend reading the book Quiet by, I believe, Susan Collins. So Quiet by Susan Collins, I think. Um, she went to Harvard. She went to Harvard Business School. She was an introvert. She talked about this. And I read this book in 2014 when I realized I was like a throbbing extrovert and I needed to understand introverts better. So I read her book. Highly recommend it. Quiet. Um, so Susan Cain, that's it. Quiet by Susan Cain. Amazing. So read that book. And thank you, Amitha <laughs> and Farana. Um, so on the introvert level, I've not only learned a lot from that book, but I've also become much quieter. I think even in the last five, six years, I went from throbbing extrovert to like, I just spent a month in quarantine by myself, like literally didn't see another human being for a, over a month. And I was okay with it. And I was able to like simmer and be quiet where I think in other times of my life, if I hadn't learned that quiet or become appreciative of it, 
I would have suffered, like my mental health would have absolutely suffered. So once you know what you are and have an appreciation for the other side, and unfortunately, if you're an introvert, I don't know how to help you understand extroverts. But if you're an extrovert trying to understand introverts, that's something I get, read that book. You need to understand that people need space and time. So I have two people on my team who need processing time. So what, after we have our OKR meetings, they need time to give follow-up and make edits to the drafts to have their voices heard and their contributions. And then every Thursday, I can say, hey, two weeks ago, we talked about OKRs. We have some new adjustments and contributions. Here's what they are. Uh, another thing you can do is in the Friday meetings, I have some team members who bring up amazing ideas that shouldn't be happening one-on-one -on -one with us. They should be happening in the development meeting. So everyone can hear these amazing ideas for the product. But then I will talk about, all right, would you like me to bring this up and credit you with the idea? Or would you like me to ask you about this on Monday in our next development meeting? Because that's really where you should be sharing this wisdom. And if people are uncomfortable speaking about it, good, I'll bring it forward. And then I'll credit them. So-and-so had this amazing idea. What do you all think? This is a technique I've been doing since I was an undergrad when I recognized that I can be loud and commanding and like I can easily grab attention. So I would notice in group projects that if there were people who said like, unfortunately from my bias perspective, that I thought they said something really good, I would lend my voice to that and say, hey, so-and-so said a really good thing. I think we should listen to what they're saying because then I'm using my voice. So I do the same thing with my team and if they need me to say it or if they need me to say, hey, so-and-so is a really fantastic idea, we need to listen to this. We give them space and time to edit documents um, in writing over time to do different things. And again, that's why we do the forward slash record for certain things. And that's why anything we talk about, if it's important, it goes in writing and it is substantiated. I'm probably the only technology startup that's been keeping minutes, like actual meeting minutes for every single meeting since there were three people on our team. I don't know any other startup at three people that does that, but we've always done it because it's important and it gives the, the opportunity for people to step away and go back and respond and reply and be engaged in that way. So a lot of things you can do to manage the different personality types. But again, as the manager, you have a hard, that's why you're paid more. Like you have a hard job, you need to do it. A lot of people just do management because they're like, want the money. I think we need to give more money to workers so that people, I know some brilliant people who never want to manage, but they need to get compensated extremely well at the thing they do to stay incentivized to keep doing that and to not manage because they don't want to. And then there are too many people who manage for the money because they feel like they have to and they don't put the thought and intentionality behind it or they don't like it. Like you have to be so intentional and it's so much work. And I've been grooming myself for this for a decade. So a lot of these answers come from reading, trying things out and working in teams and leading teams for a decade now. So thank you all. That's how I shift the way I work with extroverts, introverts, and sometimes extroverts need to be told to be quiet um, in a really polite way, which is thank you so-and-so for that contribution. And I have no problem stepping on if someone's still talking and they definitely need to stop now. Just, I just start talking and be like, all right, so-and-so, thank you so much. It's really great. We're going to put a pause for a second. Can you like slack us with that? Right? So again, you can manage all the different elements of different folks. And I know that there are definitely times when I need to be quiet, which here we are at two minutes and sorry, two o'clock and 24 minutes past. I will not stop talking. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I hope you learned very specific ticks and techniques. Thank you very much, Melissa. Such insightful workshop. We absolutely love it. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Wonderful to be here. And thank you everyone for attending. Bye.